Good evening, everybody, and a very big welcome to another Lates Online from the Natural History Museum. I'm Alison, I'm your host for today's event. Um, now, Lates Online happens on the last Friday of every month. There used to be an event that happened at the Natural History Muse Museum itself, where we give you a chance to meet some more of our scientists, find out about some of the brilliant work that they do at the museum but while we can't all safely be at the museum we decided to bring our lates on we're coming direct to you at home and we've had some fantastic topics so far the last couple of months we've used social activities and space but for tonight's event we're going to be focusing on love in the natural world in all its brilliantly diverse forms we have a very special dating show to start off tonight and then a little later on at half past eight we've got our quiz which is all about mates and mating because it's relationships that make the natural world go round but how to make that all-important connection now we humans have some pretty interesting dating rituals but we're not the only animals to actually engage in courtship and you might argue not even the most interesting so for our very first event tonight, we're offering a Natural History Museum twist on a very famous dating show. Cast your minds back to Saturday evening television in the 90s, where the nation tuned in to Blind Date, hosted by the brilliant Scylla Black. Now, it's a golden oldie, that one. So if you don't remember it, it's a really, really simple idea. Basically, three contestants bid to win a date by giving very, very cheesy answers to a series of questions. So our version is exactly the same. We have three of our scientists. They're going to be bidding to win a date. They're going to be giving equally cheesy answers to a series of questions. But our Natural History Museum twist is that our scientists are not playing as themselves. Instead, they're going to be answering as though they were one of the animals that they study in the museum. But we're not going to tell you what animal they're being. We want to see if you can guess what animal they are from the questions, uh, the answers to the questions that they give. So bear that in mind. We're going to meet our, our three contestants in a moment. The first question of the night obviously comes from me. Remember, the answers that they're giving come from the animal that they're studying, the animal that they're trying to be, okay? So let's be our very first contestant, Anjali, are you there? Hi, I'm Anjali um, and I live in the beautiful savannas of Africa. I'm looking for someone who likes to roam far from home and doesn't mind playing second fiddle to a strong partner. Oh, interesting, a strong personality and the beautiful Oh, savannas of Africa, that must be an amazing place to live. Do you, do you live alone or, or family? Oh no, I live with my very large family. Um, there are many of us that live together. It's really wonderful. And don't worry though, if my sisters or nieces get out of hand, I rule with an iron fist. I will keep them all in line. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So that's contestant number one. Very best of luck. Let's meet contestant number two. Jeff. Hello, I'm Jeff. I come from the arid regions of South Africa, and tonight I'm looking for a partner that appreciates the value of sticking together. Wow, that is another beautiful place, but arid regions, that, that can't be an easy place to live, is it? Is it quite difficult? Oh, it's quite hot. In fact, I'm only around for part of the year. Most of the year I, I remain hidden. Oh, must, must make it hard to find a partner. Well, well hopefully we, we've got a, a partner that you can stick with tonight. Thank you, and I'm hoping so. And finally, contestant number three, Erica. Oh, Erica, I think you're muted. Let's have you off mute. Hello. Hello, my name is Erica and I'm an American. And what I'm looking for is a mate that I can dance the night away with. Oh, that's rather wonderful, dancing the night away. Who, who doesn't love that? Well, hopefully we can, we can find you a, a dance partner tonight. So there we have our, our three creatures looking for love today. But 
who gets to choose between them? Let's meet the lucky person. Hello, tell us what your name is and what you're looking for. Hi, Alison, I'm Christina and I'm a science communicator. But even though I love science, I haven't found any chemistry with anyone yet. So I'm hoping I'll find my perfect partner on this show. And what I'm looking for on a partner, well, Alison, the thing is, I've been all by myself all this time. So I'm getting a little bit tired. I'm looking for somebody who who totally win me over. And I hope that I will be able to find that on the natural world, working at the Natural History Museum. So got everything crossed, even even my eyes. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well, well be someone unique for the natural world is a, is a pretty tall order. But I'm, I'm hopeful that we've, we've got someone uh, for you tonight amongst our brilliant contestants. Now, Christina, to, to help you decide, you have three questions for each of our contestants so let's have question number one so my first question is uh, about yourself so i want a mate that isn't afraid to show their attributes so i want you to tell me what do you think is your best quality okay so let's uh, let's hear from uh, contestant number one first of all what's your best quality well like I know what I want and I'm not afraid to take charge. Some might say I'm a little too aggressive, but uh, you know, I think that's a good thing. Some might also say I look a little bit too much like my brothers, but honestly, if size matters, they're no match for me. Okay, so uh, we, we've got a very uh, assertive uh, contestant number one. That, that's, that's interesting, that's interesting. What about contestant number two? Well, I don't mean to brag, but despite my small size, I'm actually quite the singer. I'll serenade you after some rainfall has set the mood. Singing in the rain, that sounds, uh, that sounds fantastic. Oh, to me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jeff, would you uh, give us a little rendition of your singing? At all? Well, sure. I'd... <laughs> Sorry, there's something in my throat. Maybe later in the broadcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a shame. What a tease. What a tease. Okay, our, our final contestant, number three. What's your best quality? I'm the most attentive of lovers. Not only will I bring you a gift to start with, but I will amuse you and I'll romance you and just serenade you completely as the night goes on. <gasps> Sounds fantastic. We've got a little image here of, of uh, great heights, I see. So uh, we're, we're, uh, yes. we're quite fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So that was our, our first question, Christina. Um, how are you doing? And any ideas so far? I don't know. I think they all are giving me different things that I do appreciate on a mate. So I'll have to go for the second question. Shall I go for it, Alison? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's have, let's have your second question. Okay, so obviously being a blind date, where we are right now, I've never seen you before. No idea how you look. So I would like you to tell me, how would I be able, able to recognize you if we were if we were out in the wild in a blind date? Oh, good question. How to recognize you in the wild. So uh, contestant number one. Okay, well, I have some features that would definitely give this away. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but you could definitely recognize me by my great big curly whites. And I've been told I have an amazing laugh. <laughs> It's an amazing, so are you quite famous for both? Um, I'm famous for those, yeah, and for other things. <laughs> okay, well, that, those are some good features. <laughs> How about contestant number two? Well, I think it's going to be my arms. Well, they're, they're far too short for a cuddle, so we'll have to be creative if you pick me as your date, but I think you'll recognize me by my arms. <laughs> by your arms? That's interesting. So, Christina, are you quite creative? I yes, I, I do like a cuddle though. So I don't know. We'll we'll, have, we'll put that in the in the in the balance. <laughs> okay, we'll see. We'll see. And um, finally, uh, contestant number three. I'll be very easy to recognise because not only will I be bringing you the biggest nuptial gift ever, my own physical attributes are, will ama amaze you because I have arguably 
one of the largest genital capsules out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't wish to brag, but it's enormous. Straight to the point there, contestant number three. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a theme in your, your answers. <laughs> mm. we'll, we'll see how you do. You know, your two questions in. Are, are you getting a bit, a bit more of a feel for our for our, our three contestants? Definitely, Alison. There's things that I like, things that I'm starting to get in a little bit more doubtful about. But since Erica mentioned gifts, um, well, I mean, I do like some chocolate, some red roses. But if you won the date with me, if you went on a date with me in the wow, what? gifts what interesting gifts would you bring to that date to give me okay so what gifts would our contestants uh bring to your date well well let's see Let, let's uh, hear from contestant uh number one angeli no sorry uh me give you a gift i don't think so um if you're lucky and you try really really hard and are a pretty good contortionist um i might not attack you and i might let you stick around maybe so i can't you know be sure but just don't get into my face and uh please try to remember your place <laughs> okay wow so, so no gift there at all um and uh, again quite an assertive answer from uh, contestant number one I, I wonder how that will go with uh with christina um but let's hear from contestant number two well, call me old fashioned, but I, I tend to get a bit attached, so I can give you my commitment. Well, at least for a few hours until you've buried me and I fertilize your egg. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, you have, you have to see the commitment. I'm not sure about the burying, but um, we'll see. Uh, I promise it won't be weird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perhaps we should hear from contestant number three. I will bring you the biggest nuptial gift, hopefully even bigger than yourselves, for you to feast on so I can distract you from me in my naughty way with you. <laughs> okay, again, uh, straight to I the have point. a pretty much one track mind. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I am you, and it's great. <laughs> Definitely a one track mind, but who knows? Perhaps that will work. Perhaps that will uh, win Christina over because I'm afraid those were your that was your final question. You, you've had all three questions now. It's 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 time to to make a decision, Christina. Any ideas at all? Alison, it's really difficult that the three contestants are giving me three different things I do appreciate, Mame. So I've got assertiveness, commitment, and a lot of sex it turns out so i don't know maybe, maybe audience uh, people watching can help me a little bit what would you prefer me to choose because i'm, I'm getting uh, a lot of doubts in here this is really difficult so if people want to end and send some suggestions that will be really really helpful but maybe we should help them give them a reminder of the three contestants so they can also choose i i honestly at this point i have no idea <laughs> so yeah, maybe we can get some, uh, some uh, advice from our, our audience. So, so uh, viewers, put your comments, put your uh, your your um, who you would like to update with in the comments section. We'll see if there, there's uh, any help there. See if, if there's any outright winners from our viewers. But to uh, give a bit of a reminder, uh, let's uh, let's give a little roundup of our, our three contestants. So, Christina and audience, who will you choose? Will it be contestant number one, a natural born leader who is definitely in with the in crowd, but Christina prepared to run with the pack? Or will it be contestant number two, a tiny little partner with a very big voice, but will it stick together? Or finally, we have contestant number three, a passionate mate. Who can take you to great heights and out for a The choice is yours. So any ideas? So we've got a couple of uh, uh, questions for, oh, so we've got uh, someone's chosen uh, contestant number two 
do, Jeff. We've got someone more. Uh, Erica, contestant number three. Uh, oh, the arms has gone down very well with the with some of our viewers, Jeff. <laughs> and Rosie on Facebook thinks you should pick contestant number one. Oh, so not a huge amount of help there, but but let's see. Oh yeah, Mike thinks contestant number one because of the the feistiness. <laughs> 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 so what do we think oh it's so so tricky christina ultimately the choice is yours who are you going to go for okay so this is really difficult but for as much as i like a good cuddle i wasn't sure about the burying bit and i do like dancing and getting intimate with my partner but i think it would be a lot of work that it looked like a lot of work so i do like a strong female partner i think i'm going to go for contestant number one oh yeah congratulations to angeli contestant number one our oh, very very feisty contestant <laughs> you have won christina over fantastic very well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited for the pair of you. <laughs> but Christina, how could you not choose our other contestants as well? Erica, mm -hmm. right. yeah, they, they were both fantastic. They did a brilliant job. I think I think I can be flexible, you know, like I one, but why not? Like <laughs> I, I can I can I can visit them. <laughs> <laughs> You can show me the best specimens anytime. <laughs> but Christina, did you have any idea about uh, any of the, the three animals that the, our contestants were trying to pick? This was tricky. And I wonder if uh, anyone in our audience was able to guess uh, what each of our, our contestants, what their animals were. If you were able to guess, if you've got any ideas, post them in the comments and, um, and we'll, we'll see what people come up with. But we'll, we'll also find out a little bit more about your date, Christina, but also uh, the, the other two dates, what you could have won as well. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start, first of all, with contestant number three, Erica. Tell us what you do Come first on. of all in the America. I am one of the creator, curators behind the scenes of the Natural History Museum. And I uh, study flies. These are obviously the best animals on the planet. I can't believe you turned me down. Seriously. And the <laughs> one I was talking about is Easley. This is a little lady. She's fabulous. She's got really hairy legs. These flies love it. This is in a group of flies called Empididae, which are the dance flies. And they, they boogie. They are born flirts. <laughs> every one of them and usually it's just the boys who do all the flirting but with this one species the girls get in the flirting action as well so we see the next slide yep i think the next slide we've got yep. some males haven't we oh, oh, no. males. see look at me look at me that's what you turned down young lady so um they are very very well known for their um exciting genitalia to say the least and I know that a lot of people think entomologists are obsessed by genitalia and that all we do is talk about it. Alison, stop nodding your head. <laughs> um, but it's actually very useful because it's actually one of the structures that evolves quicker. It changes faster. So we know which species are what by playing with their genitalia. So it's very, very useful for us to understand. And these ones are very obvious about what species they are. Fairly obvious, yeah. You mentioned your your um, <laughs> capsule, so yeah, that, that would be uh, hard to miss. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't it? <laughs> Flying in the water at quite a high rate. Whoosh, wow, what's that? <laughs> Don't look, children. Um, so the, the males and, and, and females in, in this particular species, they, they look quite different, do they? Yes. So the male is, is like that. The females in this one specific species, the males usually do all the work. But this time the males got clever and they thought, do you know what? I'm going and getting the beautiful, huge meals for these ladies. I want them to show me which of them is the better one. So they will check out the hairy legs, but they will also check out the bottoms of the lady. And there is nothing this fly doesn't like better than a massive bottom. There you go. Those orange bits are inflatable sacks. It blows up. She blows up her bottom 
midair. She wraps her legs round it and she's got big wings and she's like, hey, males, look at me and my massive bottom. Now, I, I see what is wrong with that. Having a massive bottom we know is very successful. But what she's actually trying to do is to show the males how big her abdomen is and therefore how many eggs she can actually support. So it's showing him how amazingly fecund she is. Got to like a fly with a big bottom. Absolutely. I, a hairy legs and a, and a big bottom, I can absolutely get down. <laughs> yeah. It's the COVID fly. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, let's explain the, the, the gift giving answer, because you mentioned that you would, you would, uh, you would give a, a nice tasty gift to your mate. So, so what, yeah. what was So nuptial gifts is not uncommon. Uh, we humans give nuptial gifts all the time. Um, and the flies are very, very good at it. And in this family, the males are the only the males are the only ones who hunt. So the females just don't hunt. So for the male to succeed in mating her, he has to bring her the best nuptial gift. Now sometimes he will wrap them up, so it is like your box of chocolates, and she would take time to unwrap them and eat them. Sometimes he's so sneaky, as some species, they just give an empty ball. So she spends all that time unwrapping it, and he's like, hey, hey. and she's like, oh, I'm fun. So it, there's a lot of sneakiness, and there's a lot of different ways that they've changed, but it is very common with flies. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah, you could have had a, a you could have had a, a nice meal there, Christina. So that's what. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, let's find out a little bit about uh, contestant number two, who again, sadly didn't win. Jeff, tell us what, what you know. Yeah, I'm a curator in the herpetology group. So that's the study of amphibians and reptiles. And perhaps not surprisingly, the animal I picked for tonight was a common rain frog that's in the genus Breviceps. And you may notice from looking at this picture, this doesn't look like frogs most of you are probably used to seeing. Its arms and legs are much shorter. Uh, but despite that, uh, it still needs to reproduce like most other frogs do, where it fertilizes eggs outside the female's body by holding on to the back of the female. But when your arms are that small, that creates a bit of a problem. So I picked this species because it has a really unique reproductive behavior that's evolved to solve that, where you can kind of see in this picture that I took in South Africa, that you can see on its chest. Uh, so the, the slide before this, you could see that there was some kind of bubbles on its chest region. So they have these specialized glands in their chest that create a very sticky secretion that comes out and allows them to adhere to the back of the female who's often two to three times their body size. Wow, yeah, and I think- yeah. <laughs> There you go, you can see it right there. Wow, that is not easy. So they, they literally excrete glue so that they can stick together. Is, is, yeah, is absolutely. And the, the way they do that, so um, amphibians in general are really glandular animals. They've got lots of glands all over their skin, uh, mostly to create mucus to keep their skin from drying out. But they also have these specialized granular cells that can do a lot of stuff. They can create poisons. But in this particular group of frogs, breviceps, they make this really special adhesive substance, a uh, cocktail of proteins that helps and lipids that helps hold them onto the back of the female. And so after he's attached like that, They'll wander around for a couple hours or so until they find some loose soil. They'll then together dig a hole till they're completely covered. So a few centimeters under the top soil, they'll then build a, a nest chamber that she lays her eggs in. He fertilizes and then the eggs don't go to the water. They just stay underground and they develop through their tadpole stage into little froglets. Wow, so that was what the burying was all about. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a real thing. it's a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real thing. Um, so. It's, is that common to, 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 for frogs to lay their eggs on land? You know, most of us don't think of that because a lot of frogs and toads we know lay their eggs in water and we know that they then hatch out into these tadpoles that eat and then they develop and metamorphose into adults, your classic biphasic life cycle. But there are actually quite a lot of frog species around the world that lay their eggs on land and the eggs develop completely in terrestrial environments. Uh, they, they either do it in a clear capsulized egg or they do it in like a foam nest, but they, they, they don't feed at all uh, like a tadpole does. They actually have a yolk sac, kind of like a fish, that they absorb and then uh, hatch or come out of the nest as a little developed froglet. 
Awesome. Um, we had <laughs> we had to go, uh, we've had quite a funny comment from Gail on Facebook asking, "How do you know it's a common frog? Is it because of its accent?" <laughs> well, that's a good question, Gail. Um, <laughs> I did not name the frog, but we'll get to the bottom of this. <laughs> <laughs> but it does bring us on to uh, the singing that you mentioned a bit earlier, doesn't it? You, you mentioned you had a good singing voice. What's that all about? So like many frog species, these rain frogs, they actually, to attract females, they have to sing before they can become glued. So kind of like some birds do, a lot of male frogs get together and then they sing a song that attracts the females. And so hopefully if they're lucky, a uh, female will approach and they will be able to glue themselves and complete their life cycle. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, the males get very excited and you get a, a glued chain of little males that get drug along by a female. But um, at, yeah, things hopefully work <laughs> out in the end. Oh, that's amazing. And uh, you can, I believe, we don't have the noise uh, sadly today, but I, I believe that our viewers, um, after the, this event, obviously, they can go online and look look up this little toad and they can hear the call that this, this little uh, frog makes, can't they? Um, and it's quite interesting. So yeah, they can definitely do that. Yeah, it's it's a brilliant noise. I would highly recommend doing that. It's uh, You will definitely fall in love with this little frog. I, I have, uh, I don't know about anyone else, but uh, this one's a winner for me. I'm definitely in love. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't pick Jeff as my date, but I would definitely put that call on my phone as my call uh, ringtone because it's just brilliant. <laughs> I guess nice frogs don't always finish last. No, no. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Was, can we this? Because it, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, too late, too late. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, on to our, our, our um, winner, Anjali. Uh, oh. Congratulations. Tell us, first of all, uh, what you do at the museum. I'm a researcher in life sciences, so I work on the evolution of vertebrates, usually looking at the skull um, and trying to understand how all the different kinds of forms have evolved. And I work on all different kinds of animals, but actually mainly my, my true love is, is mammals, and so I work mainly on mammals. And I wonder if anyone guessed what uh, what animal you were uh, you were supposed to be. I think we had a guess earlier that uh, someone's either a lion or a hyena. Pretty good. What animal were you, Angeli? I was a spotted hyena, a female dominant spotted hyena. <laughs> this team right there. Now these are uh, these are fascinating animals. Uh, hyenas are, are often quite misunderstood, aren't they? Uh, they're quite misunderstood animals, but they're amazing. Tell us a little bit about um, the the spotted hyena. They're particularly famous for their anatomy, aren't they? They are. They're famous for a lot of things. Well, one, this is a gorgeous little animal, right? But of oh, course, yeah. just looking at that, I wouldn't be able to tell you if that was a male or a female, um, because actually one of the really interesting things about spotted hyenas, in particular is that the, the females have evolved uh, basically a um, pseudo penis. And this is, you know, from the outside, you would have a really hard, maybe impossible time of actually telling it apart from the male penis. They even have a fake scrotum. So they have all the bits, um, uh, fake versions of all the same parts as men or male hyenas. And, um, and that's a really interesting thing that relates to lots of other aspects about their social structure that we can talk about. But it does also make things, um, in some ways, quite difficult for them. So, of course, they have to uh, reproduce and, and mate with this pseudo penis. But they also have to give birth with it. So that actually becomes um, something that's really quite dangerous in many ways. They have pretty high um, maternal death rates and even child um, death rates during birth because they have to basically squeeze their babies out of these tiny, tiny um, penises, essentially. And before you even get to the point of having kids, you, of course, have to mate. And that is a tricky matter also, um, as you can see here. And this is where being a contortionist is really important. And actually, the male hyenas did have to actually do a lot of um, practicing before they actually get around to being able to pull it off. In some cases, apparently, it's just that they have to take months of practicing as young before they can actually manage to figure out how to make it work because it is quite a difficult procedure. It also means though, that you really can't um, mate without the female hyena's complete cooperation, um, which is you know, part of their whole matriarchal society and being really the dominant uh, in, their, in their groups. 
Absolutely. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the structure of their society. What, what could Christina gain by, by joining your, your pack and, and, and getting close to you? So one of the lovely things about spotted hyenas, unlike really the other kinds of hyenas, is that they always hang out in these really big packs. And so if Christina joined, well, because she picked me, she gets to join my family. And we have a really large group, which is great for hunting and for, um, for protection and security. But it also does mean that we kind of need to know each other's place in this group. And we are, as I said, a matriarchal group. And so me as a dominant female, um, I'm the one who really tries to keep everybody in line. That means when we have a kill, I get to be the first one to eat. Um, my offspring get to be the first one to eat before the lower ranking females and their offspring. The males, you know, they get to eat last, but it's okay because we have lots of other interesting anatomical features that make it okay to make it easy for us to pick at the scraps. I think maybe the next slide might, uh, okay, well. Um, yeah, those teeth. Yeah, those teeth. But the picture before actually also shows that, you know, there's a lot of moving around or a lot of uh, interactions so that we all know where everybody else stands um, in our group. You know, there's a lot of checking out of everybody else's um, parts to see who's really the, uh, the, the most impressive uh, member of the group. Um, and then, you know, when we're eating, you know, hyenas are um, scavengers largely. We have these really impressive big teeth, those pearly trumpers I mentioned. Um, so on the next slide with those jaw pictures, you can see that those teeth that we have here are really, really big, robust teeth. And those are great for cracking bones. And so even if you are, you know, just some silly male in our group who came hopefully from some other pack because we tend not to make males from our own pack. We like the ones who've come from far away to lift it up. But even if you're this low ranking male, you don't even rank really. Well, there will be scraps for you because you can always go after the bones with these big teeth and you'll be fine. And we'll we'll make sure that you know everyone gets taken care of. And now your your answers, you were you were very assertive, weren't you, in your answers quite quite uh, almost aggressive, which which hyenas feet they are, aren't they? I, I would imagine though that that kind of aggression that in, in such a large pack, that's that's quite useful, is it? Oh, it's very useful. I mean, we really need to know where each other stands because if you have a, a big group and you have a kill, it would be a complete free for all if you didn't have some you know some orders. And so that's my job, right? I keep things, I keep everyone in line. Yeah, you know, I make sure that everybody is uh, is uh, being respectful of each other. And also, you know, I make sure that my kids have everything that they need in order to take over as being the dominant ones. In fact, that's part of the reason why a lot of people think that these, um, that this, uh, our most unique anatomical feature actually may have evolved is really to maintain the order in that social structure, maintain that social structure as opposed to you know, for anything else. And we've um, had a question from uh, one of our viewers online asking, do hyenas let outsiders into their packs? The males um, are outsiders, actually. They preferentially will mate with immigrant males. Um, because they want to make sure that they aren't like inbreeding. And so actually, um, it seems or it's been suggested that um, that they don't tend to mate with um, males that are actually from their own pack um, because of that reason. So actually, they, so they do take in outsiders, certainly um, the males are outsiders. Absolutely. Um, so three amazing um, animals there with all kinds of uh, different anatomy, different strategies. There is a huge amount of diversity out there when it comes to uh, mating, not just behaviours, but biology as well. Now, for the um, for our uh, spotted hyena, it's very difficult to, to tell the sexes apart. Um, uh, we are often uh, used to thinking of um, sex in terms of binary, male and female. But as with many things in nature, it's not quite that simple, is it? There's actually a lot more diversity out there. Uh, Jeff. Frogs, uh, reptiles and uh, amphibians generally, that, they're quite a good example, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, in particular with amphibians, I mean, it's we've known for a long time that most amphibians don't have differentiated sex chromosomes, like a lot of other vertebrates, including ourselves. But it's only recently that we've started to appreciate that most species uh, contain intersex individuals, and you see a lot of individuals that have uh, both ovarian and testicular tissues in their gonads. 
Um, this is still, this is emerging and it's, it's not super common in most species, but it's something we're learning about. And it definitely suggests that things are not as binary as they might seem from past research. Is that something we see in the insect world, um, Erica? Not quite, but um, we do have some exciting little stories. The, the classic example is with the good old stag beetle found in your garden. We're very used to the really expressive, dominant male showing off all these like, yeah, look at me, I'm amazing. And he does that because he protects his habitat, which has got the best rotten wood in. So he gets the best ladies because he's got the best food for them and their offspring. And the offspring would take up to five years to develop. Now, if these uh, offspring are actually not in a very good habitat and haven't got such a good form, you get a different type of male. You get a gamma male. And he looks just like a lady. And what he does is he covers himself in the female pheromone and he's like walks into her, the habitat. And the big old male is like, it's another lady. That's brilliant. And they go and copulate. And then he goes off, he's just done his big duty, and the little sneaky male's like, excellent, all these other ladies are mine, because now they will pick him, because he's got past the dominant male, so he's got to be quite spunky, as it were, to enable him to get in. So it's all these nice sneaky behaviours going on. <laughs> We're often, when it comes to mating, we're often presented with this idea of the the battle of the sexes. Is that a little bit too simplistic though, or, or is that very accurate in some cases? Oh, gosh, yes. There is. I mean, they are just the um, a classic example. We call it cryptic female um, choice. Because you can't see a lot of her choice because with the males, as with my little uh, boys back then, it's pretty obvious what uh, their attributes are. But to pick a good female, it's quite hard. So inside her, she's doing a lot to basically try and destroy all the males. There's, um, for example, there's a fruit fly called Drosophila bifurcata, and its sperm, because it wants to outcompete all the other sperm, uh, the other males, is 5.8 centimeters long. So her insides, she's a fly that's three millimeters long, by the way. Her insides are really complicated as well because she's trying to stop his sperm. So he keeps evolving sperm bigger and bigger. And she's like, no, no, no. And evolving her, her, her lady bits bigger and bigger as well. Crazy. Wow. <laughs> a really long sperm. Yeah. Big sperm, isn't it? It's that, yes. Like, <laughs> Erica. <laughs> I know the insect world is well. It's it's not just eye opening; it's eye watering when it when it comes to eating. <laughs> I, you, yeah, I know. You have a very fascinating talk that you deliver on this this very subject, <laughs> which is absolutely brilliant. Um, we've had a question from uh, online. Uh, Dee was asking: Some animals can some animals change their sex depending on the environment or depending on who's available. I know we see that in fish. Do we see that yeah. in amphibians? Yeah, like I said, um, there, there's evidence in amphibians that that does happen. Mm. And I mean, just I, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on that type of change, but I know from other morphological changes that happen, it's incredibly dependent on environment. So uh, one example that came to mind is there are some salamanders that don't develop eyes when they live in cave systems. But if you have cave systems where it's a gradient of darkness to light, um, as you get closer to the light, if they develop under those conditions, they will develop eyes. And so, yeah, environment definitely plays a role. And it wouldn't surprise me if that's related to some sex changes or um, what type of gonadal tissues develop in something. There's also examples of um, the environment needing not to have sex when we have parthenogenesis. So oh, yeah. if the environments and things like that, so a little aphid, Go in your garden and have a look at that little aphid because that may be a grandmother before she's even given birth. Because in her, she has little nymphs developing inside her and in those, there's more nymphs developing. So you have a Russian doll of this bug in your garden. So if the conditions are favorable, she just pumps them out. She's like a super fecund mother going for it. But when she when times must, then they will have males. The males, as sorry, Jeff, Males have a very limited use, <laughs> and she she deals with them when she can. <laughs> There's a, a surprising amount going on in our back gardens. If we uh, if we only knew, <laughs> I generally describe our back gardens as a 1980s nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, 
there's more to life than mating. <laughs> Surely, there's, there's, there's more to life to, to sex. Is sex always about reproduction? Or does sexual characteristics and behaviours have other functions too? Um, and Johnny, I'm thinking specifically of the uh, our spotted hyena example. Right. Yeah, so even though it seems like when you're talking about, you know, evolving a pseudo penis that it would have to do with sex and reproduction actually it's not driven by that at all really in fact as, as i mentioned you know having the pseudo penis makes both sex and reproduction much much more difficult and maybe you know maybe it's good to have some control more control um for the females in terms of who can mate with them um in general i think it, it becomes quite a problem for that but really the reason well the exact reason is that well known but some of the hypotheses for why fem uh, hyenas you know, evolved the structure is really about that social structure. So it's not about the males at all. It's actually about signaling to the other females um, about who's dominant in their society and who gets to feed first. And you know, they do it through um, having you know, higher expression of hormones like testosterone and things like that. But, um, but really it's not about their relationship with the males. It's really about their relationship with the other females. And that's why when two female hyenas meet each other, they do, um, you know, show each other their genitals um, to kind of express their dominance or their, their their standing. So it really has nothing to do with with sex and reproduction. These sex parts in in hyenas is really just about you know their status in their pack, um, who feeds, whose children um, are fed first. Um, who gets to mate first or who gets to choose those sorts of things. So it's really about dominance. It's not really to do with sex at all. Yeah, that kind of yeah. that, that reminds me of some really territorial lizards that get these exaggerated sexual secondary characteristics and are really brightly colored. And that there are males in those populations that t turn out looking like females, just like in the hyenas, but to, so not only that they can mate with females, but also just so they can be around and not attacked and killed by the big bright males. Oh, that's right. Actually, that is one of the um, hypotheses also for why the females also may have evolved this male characteristic of the hyenas is because sometimes the dominant female hyenas can actually kill the female young of lower ranking female hyenas because they may, you know, challenge them going for when they grow up. So sometimes some have suggested that actually maybe the young have evolved, you know, uh, developing these these fake penises quite early on so that the dominant female thinks that they're male and doesn't kill them. So yeah, very, very similar. There's also examples that I'd say that uh, reproduction is very useful for feeding. So there's a lot of insects that this is the only time they actually feed, i.e. on the person, on the opposite member of sex. One of my favorite uh, cute stories about this is a bark lice. And these are found in the Caribbean, the species. And the female has an inflatable penis. And she basically inflates it inside him and then uses it to hoover up his insides. So she will be in cop with him for quite, I think it's about 72 hours. And that is basically, she's getting enough of his liquid for her to sustain herself. So he's having the privilege of fathering her children and she's feeding on his insides. Alison, your face is <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a gift, isn't it? <laughs> Well, it's better than death. I mean, he does walk away. A lot of insects don't. <laughs> I, I do love talking to you, Erica. <laughs> now, we've had a, a great question. Another great question uh, from online. Uh, Dee is asking, uh, do we think that animals have sex for fun or because it feels good, just like humans do? Uh, we tend to only think of, of uh, sex for procreation a lot when it comes to animals, but is it possible they, they have sex for fun? They certainly do for practice. Um, they certainly do more than they need to in some cases. Um, Absolutely. I think there's definitely um, anecdotal evidence of animals masturbating, right? Uh, sorry for the kids, though. Uh, um, yeah, so I would, I, I think it's a hard thing to actually assess. I mean, how would we know if it was just for fun, if they were trying to procreate, unless we had some real reason for thinking they weren't reproducing, but maybe there's other non-mammal examples that are more clear cut. Um, yeah. Well, flies go at it for hours, so they've got to be getting some enjoyment. But yeah. there is the absolute opposite, where I know that it's called traumatic insemination, where you copulate once and his genital genitalia will shred her insides. 
So that can't, I, I, I mean, I may be just trying to personify myself on this, but I can't imagine that's fun at all. No, no. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, from, the, from the amphibian world, we know that some of the breeding aggregates that form, they just have thousands of males that all come together and thousands of females too. And I, I think that, that there's got, that's gotta, there's gotta be something to compel them that feels good to do that. Right. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's difficult to know from a scientific perspective, but it seems like everybody's having a good time from a very uh, anthropomorphic kind of, you know. Absolutely. I mean, sorry. Except for the example that Erica just gave. Exactly. <laughs> no one's having fun there. <laughs> um, earlier on in our, our, our stream, we had a question uh, from uh, Daniel online. Uh, he was wondering, what's the best animal to base oneself on to win a mate? <laughs> yeah, I... Fly, obviously. Yeah, Erica's going to say fly. <laughs> you come on. If, yeah, you've got some amazing attributes going on I, I you know and, and you're you're entertaining you're very important uh, so many of the world's questions are answered by you fly so you, you do a lot of things and you're you're you can get under the radar because people will just go oh, it's only a fly and then you're like no check me out i'm amazing <laughs> oh, yeah, de very definitely a, a fly there from Erica. Uh, any other options from uh, Jeff and Anjali? What what animal would you say had a had a good mating strategy? Well, before tonight, I would have said frogs because you saw that diagram. Oh. There's so many different reproductive modes, but I think if I if I do this again, I'm coming back as a snake. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Period. Polarizing. Some people love you. Some people hate you. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and Anjali, would it, would it be hyena or, or, or a different animal, do you think? I mean, well, I, I may be slightly biased by um, the act of, of, of childbirth. I've done it a few times, but I would have said seahorses, where the males actually are the ones oh, that get pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or penguins, where the males are the ones that, you know, take care of the eggs. Um, again, <laughs> with me, you know, reflecting my own. You've definitely got a theme. <laughs> 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 or dogs dogs are pretty good oh yeah. so some um, great options there some great options yeah. there <laughs> we are almost out of time uh, i do have one last question though obviously this has been a bit of fun we, we we've had a giggle but we've learned a lot as well why is it important to study these behaviors in animals not to be think okay. erica why 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 why, why because it, these, um, so there's many different ways and why, but one of the reasons I like is because it helps us understand our own behaviour. Now, you may not think that the mating life of a fly is important, but actually it, flies are so genetically related to us that in looking at them, looking at their genes and looking at our genes, we can actually make assumptions. Um, one of my, my, my favourite little stories recently is we've, we've been sending flies into space since 1947. They're amazing. And we wanted to understand what it was like to reproduce in space. So we sent the flies up. We sent 15 flies up. Two weeks later, 3,000 came back down. So we know that actually reproduction that is, is successful in space. And in that. so we can, we can practice these things because it's not ethical to do it with humans. But we can also understand different mating practices because flies do like to get drunk as well. And stop me if I'm wrong, or if you haven't heard this, but when males flies get drunk, they become way more amorous, really amorous. And basically anything goes, they don't mind. But as they get more amorous, their ability to flirt increases, but their ability to um, carry on the actions decreases massively. And so it's been interesting. We can look at understanding what the alcohol is having on the behavior and the long term effect of the alcohol on the genes. And this helps us understand our own reproductive strategies. I guess I'd say in sexually re reproducing species, understanding these behaviors is, I mean, it's, it's kind of really fundamental because not only like when we, when we know where, how, and when animals reproduce, it not only tells us a lot about their biology, but it also tells us about how their ancestors avoided extinction. And because we know from the fossil record that's so common, that really is a huge window into, yeah, unraveling the mysteries of the tree of life, I think. Absolutely, and uh, Anjali, I'm, I'm guessing you would agree with that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Just following up on Jeff's point, you know, trying to understand what are the different factors that really allow the, the species that are around today to um, to succeed, to evolve to their, or adapt to their environments. Um, what are the things that actually are beneficial um, through through changing conditions, give them that sort of adaptability, um, and tie that to you know, kind of their past record, but also what they're going to do going future, going uh, into the future as we kind of grapple with this big biodiversity and climate crisis. Um, really trying to understand you know these different behaviors um, is really central to understanding how species are going to respond to those changes, and so it's critical for really understanding and and really preserving biodiversity. Absolutely. There, there is more to life than sex, but it, it's just still really, really important to study it. <laughs> well, we are unfortunately um, out of time, I'm afraid. It's been fantastic speaking to you all today. Uh, Christina and Anjali have a date that they need to be getting on to. <laughs> <laughs> so we should leave it there. Massive con congratulations to Anjali, commiserations to Jeff and Eric. But thank you so much for being so game tonight and, and just being a bit silly with us today. Um, but it, it's been brilliant talking to you all and hopefully uh, we can see you all again soon. But for now, we will say goodbye to our scientists. Bye well, guys, we hope to see you soon. But viewers, don't go anywhere. We've only barely scratched the surface when it comes to the huge spectrum of sexual behaviours in nature and biology as well. There's so much more to these behaviours than meets the eye and obviously so much more left to learn. We've given you just a glimpse, just, just three examples there, but there is more to come because coming up, we do have our quiz, the mating game, all about mates and matings. That's gonna be starting in, in, in about 10 minutes time. We're gonna start that quiz at 8.30. So you have some time to go grab a pen and paper, refresh your drinks, Get your thinking caps on, get ready for our quiz. We'll see you again very, very shortly, half past. Thank you.
everybody welcome back to the second part of our late tonight this is our usual pub quiz type event so we've got a quiz for you tonight all about mates and mating uh, which i hope you enjoy to help me along with our quiz tonight i'm going to be joined by uh, our host khalil khalil hey, awesome. are you there how's it going yeah, yeah, good. It's good to see you. Did you did you enjoy our, our dating show earlier? I was behind the scenes laughing in my kitchen and thing away uh, whilst looking at the comments and stuff. It was great. It took me way <laughs> back to the 90s. Absolutely, absolutely. Bit, a bit of a golden oldie, but, uh, but some fun, bit of fun. Um, so we've got our quiz next. So I'll just go through uh, just a little bit of uh, a bit of background, bit of rules uh, for everyone, so we know what's going on. Uh, so all you're going to need is pen and paper. We've got three rounds, um, and there's one point for each correct answer for each question, unless we tell you otherwise. Now we obviously want to know your quiz name. If you've got a brilliant quiz team name, do post that in the comments. Um, but we do ask that you don't post your answers 
to, in the comments during the quiz. We want everyone to be able to play along. Uh, so, so don't post your answers. Give those answers. You're not going to have to remember each question. They will appear on the screen. So don't worry about that. And we've got three rounds about interesting behavior, interesting um, biology, um, but we've also got a, a, a round called significant otters as well. Um, so we're looking forward to that. But, but let's dive in with our first round. So I think we've got biology uh, to start off with. Um, so, so Khalil, what's, what's our first question? Well, before we kick off, I'm really looking forward to seeing some of the team names in the chat. I think this topic is really fertile ground for some good puns. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> so our first question <clears throat> is that parthenogenesis is a, it's a form of reproduction in which an egg can develop into an embryo without being fertilized by a sperm. Uh, it comes from the word parthenos, meaning virgin in Greek. So parthenogenesis is literally virgin birth. Several insect groups, including aphids, bees, and ants, can reproduce this way. But which of these vertebrate groups have also been known to reproduce by parthenogenesis? So the options we've got are fish, snakes, lizards, birds, or all of the above. So get okay. I know there are some examples that might be more commonly known in the natural world, uh, but out of these, one or any of them or all of them. Interesting. So the parthenogenesis did briefly come up in our, uh, our, our, our talk a little bit earlier, but I, I'm not sure that would have helped a huge amount. Um, so quite a, a, a tricky one, but we'll, we'll see how people do. I've already seen an amazing team name in the comments. Gonad or go home. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> oh, and another one, it's getting otter in here. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, viewers. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. They don't disappoint. <laughs> so let's have question number two. Now, uh, spermatozoa are the cells that make up sperm, and they come in a huge range of forms. So for this question, we're going to show you three drawings of, of uh, spermatozoa, and we're going to give three animals to match them with now this is quite tricky so let's let's see the three drawings um and we've got three animals so these were drawn by uh, our host christina who is quite the artist but they aren't necessarily in the correct order so can you match uh the sperm spermatozoa with the animal wow those are some elaborate sperm yeah yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming these aren't life size. No, no. Well, well, who knows? You know, Erica <laughs> and her, her, her fly sperm. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> That's a great brand name, Erica and the fly sperm. <laughs> but let's see how people do. Um, so let's have our, our third question. So our third question. Fungi are not set of organisms that traditionally jump to mind when thinking about mating strategies or, or anything like that, but maybe they should. The, 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 the baker's yeast that we use to make bread and make it rise, for example, is capable of switching its sex. And there, and there are some types of fungi that have way more than two sexes or in, in the fungal world called mating types. Many more, in fact. There's one species of fungi, Schizophilum commune, Really, really shines when it comes to this kind of diversity. So approximately how many mating types or sexes in the fungal world does this fungus have? Is it 10, 200, 1,000, or 20,000? I mean, compared to two, all of them are a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I think this one's really, really tricky. Um, maybe the, that some of our viewers out there will, will know this, but I'm, I, I found this one quite difficult. I don't know. I've never dated a fungus. No, me neither. Me neither. We need to branch out, yeah. <laughs> so let's have uh, question number four. So Blue Planet Two, that amazing uh, BBC show, it showed us the marvelous Asian sheep-headed wrasse, which is a fish that changes sex. They're sequential hermaphrodites, so they can switch sex permanently at points in their lives. But which 
coral reef fish made famous in a much loved film franchise can also change sex. So which coral reef fish? If it's the film franchise I'm thinking of, it's one of my favorite film franchises. Of oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping people will get that one because I, I feel like that one, one, that one, yeah, I feel like that one might be a one that is a bit easier for people to get. So uh, that was our final question in uh, round one. We now move on to round two. Now this round is all about behavior, interesting behaviors, and it's a video round. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you a series of videos. Now, if you've ever seen Isabella Rossellini's fantastic green porno films, it's a similar sort of idea, but with a, a much, much, much smaller budget. You might say <laughs> Uh, so our host, Christina, who we met earlier, very gamely has imitated some courtship behaviours from the animal kingdom. And we want you to guess what animal Christina is imitating in each of the videos. You get one point for each correct guess. So now, let I, I haven't seen any of these videos yet, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this as much as the viewers are. There's some great acting in these videos <laughs> and even some special effects. So let's have... Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, popular. <laughs> yeah, very, very popular. <laughs> but what animal was she, was she? Or I think there's more than one animal well, there. I wonder what clues we're getting from that. So, you know, there, there were a lot of small individuals who seemed pretty attached. I don't know. They seemed very attached, didn't they? We'll see. We'll see. Um, so let's see how many people get that, get that one. I, I'm hoping lots of people will guess, guess that one. But let's have our second video. Got a deep bow there. Yes, very formal, very formal uh, ritual that one. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's always time for some old fashioned you know, courtship, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely. That one's tricky, I think. I'm, I'm not sure if I, I would uh, get that one. Uh, but we'll see how our, how our viewers do. And we have just one more video left to show you. So let's play our third and final video. Oh, mind-blowing special effect. <laughs> no expense spared. It's like Avatar 2. <laughs> but what animal could she have been imitating? Now, I think that one is particularly difficult, but there, there might be, there might be some, some uh, correct guesses out there. We will have to see. Uh, so that was our, our, our third and final video, and that was the end of round two. So we're going to move swiftly on to our final round, round three, which we have called Significant Otters. This is all Amazing about types. different types of, of pairings in the animal kingdom and, and reasons why animals might get together. So let's have our first uh, question from uh, round three. Khalil. As we saw from our previous discussion in the, uh, in, the, in the blind date game, spotted hyenas have complex societies. The secret to success in spotted hyena clans is becoming the friend of a friend. The ability to form lasting friendships or what are called cohesive clusters is important in maintaining the social structure of a clan. But how do individual spotted hyenas rec recognize their friends and allies? By sight? by sound, by smell, or all of the above. Uh, hopefully there would have been some clues if you watched our, uh, our talk a, a little bit earlier. There might have been some, a, a couple of clues in there as to, as to the answer to this one. But um, hmm, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how people do. Do you think you'd get that one, Kadil? I don't know, because 
I don't. I think I know a little bit about hyenas, and that might be <laughs> enough to confuse me. Yeah. I know that they have quite strong senses in various situations and in various ways, but yeah, I don't know whether I'm overthinking it. I overthink a lot, so it's a toughie. Okay, okay. Let's have our next question. Now, here's a pairing you might not have considered when it comes to mates and mating. Plants and insects. The pollinating insects help flowering plants to reproduce by transferring pollen from one flower to another as they collect food. Now, coloured petals and a strong scent can, uh, scent can help attract insects to a flower, but there are some species of orchid that go a bit further. So what does the bee orchid do to attract its insect pollinator? There could be any number of answers to this one, but... Yeah, I'm assuming it doesn't fly around like a bee. That seems vicious for an orchid. Yeah, that would be very impressive for an orchid. So, yeah, something a bit I mean, more... I hope it's that. That'd be great. <laughs> well, we'll find out in a little while. Um, so moving on, let's have our third question. So not all pairings between significant otters are male-female. Same-sex pairings are also quite common in nature. Can you tell us what well-known and much-loved oceanic mammals form lifelong pair bonds between males? Okay, so that question is what well-known, much-loved ocean mammals, okay, form lifelong pair bonds. So there are, there are a few key words in there. They've got to live in the ocean, they've got to be mammals, and these pair bonds have to be lifelong bonds, not just uh, fleeting uh, companionships, and between males okay. so a lot of specificity into that question but yeah the answer there's a there's a lot to go on there i'm, I'm hoping uh, quite a few people will get the the answer to this one now we are uh we're almost at the end of our quiz we've got a couple more questions to go uh, so let's have our fourth question now London Zoo famously houses two male Humboldt, Humboldt penguins, Ronnie and Reggie, who have pair bonded. The couple got together in 2014, they're still going strong and they are far from alone. Same sex um, pairings are, have been recorded in many penguin species, both in the wild and in captivity, but it isn't just penguins. Which of these aquatic birds has not been known to form long lasting same sex pairs in the wild? Geese, swans, ducks or albatrosses? So which has not been known to form long-lasting pair bonds, same-sex pair bonds in the wild? It appears that we've had a little bit of a, a little bit of wonky formatting on, on, our, on, our, on our... A our, little bit. Hopefully everyone can see that. Apologies for that. Um, yeah, I hope you can infer from that most of the word albatrosses. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Geese, so this, swans, ducks, albatrosses. <laughs> but this is a tricky one because remember, this is which of these birds has not been known to form yeah. these pairs. Yeah, and, we don't want to make it too easy for people. And these are partnerships that last many years as well. So yeah. just this question, make sure you're paying attention to those specific bits. Absolutely. And I think we're on to our, our final question of the night, aren't we, Khalil? Already? Damn. Yeah, yeah, so quick. <sighs> we're just too good at this job. <laughs> For many animals, including humans, mating behaviours is not just about reproduction. It can serve all sorts of other functions, particularly for social animals that live in groups. And as we mentioned earlier, for dolphins, sex can help individuals form social bonds with one another. One of our close relatives, the bonobos, or pygmy chimpanzees, are famous for being very caring and sharing. In bonobo society, sex is employed in a number of different ways. Aside from reproduction, can you name one other reason bonobos will engage in sexual behavior? So this is a pretty okay. open question. Yeah, so uh, aside from reproduction, so not reproduction, but any other reason bonobos might engage in sexual behaviors. And there, there are a number. Um, of reasons, so that, that there are there are some there are some options there for people. I, I'm sure uh, some people will uh, will uh, get some of, some of these guesses correct. And I guess these have got to be uh, reasons 
for which there, there is evidence uh, that we've observed in bonobo society, because if, if it's such an open-ended question, you could, you could make up some pretty wild stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what people come up with. <laughs> they do have this reputation for being the caring, sharing. Um, but do, they do really engage in, in, in these behaviours under certain circumstances. It's, it, yeah, so, <laughs> just to be clear on that. It's not like Burning Man. No, absolutely not. <laughs> so that was our final question in, a, in, in our final round. Um, so we'll, we'll give people a couple of, of, of minutes perhaps to, to, um, to get their answers. So by my calculation, there are, uh, there are 14 possible points that you could, uh, could win in our quiz. So, so bear that in mind. We're going we're gonna to give our answers in, in just a second. What do we think, Khalil? Do we, do we think uh, this was a, a, a tough quiz or do you think we, we're going to have uh, some high scores for this one? I mean, I, I'm, I'm a biologist by training and I think this was a toughie. I'd be very impressed if people get, get high scores. Unless, you know, that's, that's their thing and they just know a lot about animal uh, sexual behaviour. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, it's a very interesting subject. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's one of the amazing things about the natural world is that because there's so much diversity of life, there's always something weird and new to find out, whether it's about, you know, sex sexual behaviours or, or, or mating or whether it's about like, you know, parasitism or, you know, um, symbiosis or the way that certain organs have evolved for really specific functions. Life is so much weirder than we could imagine. It, it seriously is, but yeah, endless forms, endless possibilities. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think we've given people enough time uh, to, to to get all their answers. So, uh, so let's uh, let's go back through our our questions, and and we'll give you guys some answers. We'll see how you got on. So, our very first question uh, in round one, uh, Khalil. Uh, let's remind everyone of the question. So the question was about parthenogenesis, which is a form of reproduction where an egg can develop into an embryo without having to be fertilized by a sperm beforehand. Um, this comes from the, the Greek word parthenos, meaning virgin. So it's kind of a virgin birth. And we were asking which of these vertebrates have also been known to reproduce by parthenogenesis, because there are lots of insects that we know do it. Um, and we asked whether it was fish, snakes, lizards, birds, or all of the above. And the answer was, all of the above. So sharks, pythons, pit vipers, whiptail lizards, Komodo dragons have even uh, given birth. So there were two Komodo dragon, female Komodo dragons that were kept isolated in, in, in zoos and they've given birth without having uh, mated with a, with a male. Arthenogenesis has also been seen in some birds, including chickens. Uh, but in birds, it very rarely ends, ends with a chick hatching from the egg. It often is uh, a sterile egg. Although it's pretty rare in vertebrates compared to invertebrates, parthenogenesis does happen in quite a, lot of, uh, quite a lot of groups of animals. Scientists are still working out how and why exactly this happens because in terms of evolution it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting strategy. It, it really is and, and well done if you guessed all of them. I'm, I'm hoping uh, some of our, our audience got that one correct. Um, let's uh, move on to question number two. So this was our picture round, wasn't it? So we, uh, we showed you three uh, spermatozoa and we asked you to match uh, the, the, the cell with its animal. So you get one point for each correct match. So let's take a look at those images again and our answers. So look at that. So we've got them mouse we've got the echidna and the finch this is the correct order so now, why i know i mean <laughs> the the, the diversity in form first of all is amazing um but generally as uh, spermatozoa are able to move this is because typically they need to travel to, to reach the egg now the spermatozoa of uh mice and rats they have those those hook shapes they look a bit like talons and one theory is that the sperm um, will cooperate they'll they'll use those hooks to hook together to help them swim faster than they can on their own 
<laughs> like and, those little toy monkeys. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> And apparently it's a similar situation with um, echidna sperm. So they also form bundles that can swim faster uh, than indivi individual um, cells. And, and this it could potentially be an adaptation for sperm competition because echidnas and I believe uh, mice and rats as well, they'll mate with multiple partners. So by teaming up their sperm cells uh, from, from the individual, from each individual might be increasing their chance of getting to the egg first so well, that it's nice to see a little bit of cooperation in biology sometimes instead absolutely of just... it's definitely out there it's definitely out there um <laughs> we, sh we should say it's not all about the sperm being active and the egg being passive because the egg has loads of adaptations as well to actually allow it to choose which um, sperm fertilizes it so egg producers are not just sitting there passively waiting to be fertilized it's it's all very much more complex than yeah that. loads of very clever enzymes Absolutely. It's amazing stuff. So well done if you got that um, answer correct, because I think that was incredibly tricky. I would have had no idea. Yeah, I, I, mine would have been a total guess. Um, yeah. I, I, would just, I just got too distracted by the, the hooks and the <laughs> corkscrews and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But let's have a let's have our, our our next question question number three. So this one was about uh, fungus. So remind us. Yeah. Of this. So this was a question about uh, the the number of mating types that that fungi have. So fungi we don't necessarily call them sexes because of the kind of diversity of them and the the way that fungal reproduction works a little bit differently from from ours. But the question was: There's one species of fungus, uh, Schizophyllum communi that has a very large number of mating types. And we were asking whether it's 10, 200, 1,000, or 20,000. And the answer is conservatively 20,000. Actually, it could be more like 23,000. It's, it's uh, you know, we're still, still finding more ones. And the source of all this variety is, is their DNA. There are two regions of the genome that determine sex in this species. Um, let's call them A and B for now. And the genes in these two regions come in many different possible variations. And so the sex of each individual is determined by the specific combination of gene variants A and B in the, in the A and B positions. And so the number of possible sexes within these species can be thousands. And, you know, every time a new mutation in, it emerges in one of these genes, you can create a whole load more. So that gives this fungus lots of options when it comes to partners. Um, and it's really good for preventing inbreeding as well. Absolutely, yes. I, I guess for a, 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 an organism that, that can't you know, move around a great deal, can't travel very far, uh, having that, that variety close by is very, very useful. I know the feeling, man. Lockdown's hard. <laughs> it is. It's really tough. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to uh, our next question. Uh, so, oops. Oh, so that that oh sorry that was our our um, our little. Fungus. Oh, was that was that the super sexy fungus? That was the, that was the super sexy fungus. It's quite beautiful. Um, yeah. For our our uh, next question, we asked you which coral fish um, could change sex. So this this was a fish made famous by a much loved uh, film franchise. Um, but they, this fish can change sex at some point in its life. So I wonder if anyone guessed. So let's have our answer. It is, in fact, the clownfish. I'm so glad that it's difference. Oh. Oh, I love that film. Did you, did you guess? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the clownfish, of course, from, from Finding Nemo. So uh, clownfish live in small groups in protective sea anemones. Um, and there's one breeding pair and a number of subordinate non-breeding fish. Now, if the, the dominant female in the in the, the pair dies in many cases the reproductive male will gain weight and they'll become the female for that group and then the largest non-breeding male then sexually matures and they become the reproductive male for that group so at the beginning of the film when that barracuda comes and uh and kills nemo's mum in real life does that mean that his dad would have then become his mum and got a new husband yeah, yeah. That would have been a very different film. 
completely different film. <laughs> so that was our uh, that was our, our final question, I believe, in uh, round one. So for for round two, we we played you. Oh, there's Nebo there. Look at that. They are lovely, aren't they? <laughs> So for round two, we played you a series of uh, videos made by our fantastic host, Christina. She was imitating the mating strategies of certain animals. But which animals was she imitating? So we've got a little still there of the, the first video, video one. I wonder if anyone guessed what animal she might have been imitating there. I see lots of little red people lots of little, little green person or is there more than one green person it's hard there's to more than one there's a whole variety there um but yeah they are all firmly stuck to christina aren't they <laughs> so which might give you a, a bit of a clue um, so let's have our answer it was the anglerfish obviously Obviously, obviously. <laughs> now, I, I wonder if some people might have guessed uh, frog from um, Jeff's uh, little uh, little frog animal early, which which oh did, yeah, curveball. Uh, yes, did stick to its mate, but in fact, it is the anglerfish. So these, this is a, a deep sea anglerfish. Um, they live obviously in the depths of the ocean. Very, very tricky to to uh, find and keep hold of a mate in in the deep dark ocean. So they have a way around this. Um, they will sniff out their mate and then latch onto them. And eventually the two partners actually fuse their bodies together and effectively become one. And you'll often find multiple partners as well. You might often find multiple males attached to a female. So, interesting strategy. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to anthropomorphize it too much, but that does sound a bit like codependency. How is she stick together? Obviously, we've got to be careful about, you know, anthropomorphizing animal behavior too much as well. Absolutely. Um, so for our second, <laughs> I believe we've got a, a, another screenshot of uh, Christina uh, doing her, her thing. So what animal could Christina have been imitating in this video? This was the one where she was bobbing quite a lot, sort of almost bowing. A deep bow, yeah. Very deep bow. What animal that might have been? I would not have guessed. It, I don't think. I mean, I'm imagining quite a formal animal. So, like <laughs> something that gives off a bit of a bit of a stuffy vibe. <laughs> potentially, potentially. Let's have our answer. It was the horned owl. There we go. You know, they've got a, almost a tweed vibe. <laughs> Oh, when when courting, apparently horned owl pairs will they'll call to one another, but they'll also nod. They'll sort of bow forward, and they will spread their wings as well. And 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 both uh, pairs will will do this. They'll engage in this behaviour, so almost like a dance. So that's the, the 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 sort of thing that Christina was going there for. There, I think she did a pretty good job. That's an excellent reenactment. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And hopefully, uh, so, some of our viewers got this one. I don't think I would have though. Uh, <laughs> no, not in a million years. <laughs> not in a million years. Exactly. We had one final film, which I think was also quite tricky as well. So let's have a look. So yeah, we had uh, quite a stripey. Christina in this video, didn't we? We had a little bit but of effort. suddenly stripey though. She wasn't stripey suddenly stripey. She didn't start off, off stripey, did she? She suddenly got stripey. So so what animal could she have been imitating? Really tricky this one, I think. But let's have our answer. It was the pipefish. So I mean, that doesn't look particularly stripey to me. It doesn't. It doesn't at the moment. It depends maybe on it's the... not maybe it's not very excited. <laughs> it does depend on the species but in some species of pipefish the females compete with one another for access to mates and they are often more ornamented they may develop brighter colors during courtship or they may display a temporary striped pattern to help attract a mate so that was what we were going for there so i think christina did a pretty good job actually yeah absolutely <laughs> Just too, too bad my knowledge of animal courtship rituals is just 
way lacking. Although, you know, yeah. a lot. <laughs> Every day's a school day. It is, it is. And it, you know, it, it's boring if you know all the answers. So that was our video round. Well done if you got uh, those those answers correct. We'll move on to our third and final <coughs> second otters. We had some uh, very interesting questions in that one. Khalil, remind us of our first question. So our first question was about spotted hyenas. And they're in their complex societies, the secret to success is you know, really forming tight, what we call cohesive clusters. So lasting and and firm and complex social interactions and friendships and relationships. But how do individual spotted hyenas recognize their friends and mates and allies from their rivals and enemies? Is it by sight, by sound, by smell, or all of the above? Well, the answer was all of the above. So spotted hyenas are really, really intelligent and have, oh, sorry, I've just seen that the box is- It's a little bit wonky. <laughs> sorry. Um, the sort of the spotted hyenas are really, really intelligent and they have really good vision, especially because uh, they they uh, are active both in the day and the night. So they, they can they to see very well. They pay close attention to body postures and kind of behavioral displays of other animals. And they have a huge repertoire of sounds as well, using growls, whoops, and that really famous laugh. And studies suggest that they can recognize the individual sounds of others. Um, so a mother will recognize the call of her young, for example. And finally, just like a lot of mammals, smell plays a really, really important role in the social lives of hyenas. Each clan has a unique scent um, that they share and use to mark their territory, and they can distinguish the individual scents of their clan mates. They are really amazing animals, hyenas. I think they get uh, they get a bad they get a bit of a bad rep, but they are they're pretty fantastic animals. I love them, and I think they're really really beautiful, especially the spotted. Yeah. They've got that really distinctive silhouette. I love them. Absolutely, and of course, our, our hyena was the winner earlier. So <laughs> big love for hyenas. I think the lion king was really bad publicity for hyenas. <laughs> Yeah, it was a little bit. <laughs> Hopefully, that um, uh, yeah, they'll get a bit of a better reputation. Um, but let's move on to our second question in round two. So this one was about uh, pollinators um, and plants. So oh, we've got our, our beautiful hyena there. But we asked you, what does a bee orchid do to attract its insect pollinator? It goes a little bit further than most other plants. So I think I've heard of this before, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I think some of our viewers might might know, might maybe know this one. I, I think it might be slightly more common knowledge. But is it the, the old bait and switch? Is it, sorry? The old bait and switch. Uh, <laughs> let's have the answer. So they produce flowers that look and smell like bees specifically female bees so they attract male bees um, so it's an interesting strategy they the insect provides a pollination service when they mistakenly try to mate with the bee like flowers they'll get pollen uh, usually on their heads and then they will transfer it to the next uh, flower that they again mistakenly try uh, to mate with so uh, there's a there's a lot in it for the uh, the orchid, but not very much in it for our poor bee, is there? Well, that's an interesting strategy because you know most flowers, <clears throat> sorry, most flowers will attract pollinators like bees by using nectar, and you know that that's a reward for the for the pollinator for the bee. But that's also really expensive to make because you have to put a lot of sugar into it, and that's one of the main resources that plants are making. So I guess it might be cheaper to make a fake bee than it is to make a load of nectar to attract a bee in a kind of traditional exchange. Potentially, potentially. Um, I, I think another idea is the uh, traditional pollination. A lot of the pollen gets lost along the way as the, the, the um, pollinator is, is, is flying about. But it seems with this strategy, uh, more of the pollen um, is transferred to the to the, the next plant, so it might, that might be uh, another 
uh, reason why this this is as 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 evolved because it's it's not just bees. There are uh, all kids uh, mimic other insects as well with a similar sort of strategy. Um, so it, it's 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 definitely got to be good for the orchids. That's fascinating. Now let's move swiftly on to our next question. This was question number three in our round. Uh, so Khalil, remind us of this one. So this was a question where we were asking you about uh, like long-term pairings um, in mammals that are, that are same-sex pairings rather than uh, kind of male-female pairings that might be more more commonly known from like documentaries and stuff. But we asked you whether you could tell us what well-known and much-loved ocean mammals form lifelong pair bonds between males? And the answer was bottlenose dolphins. So pair bonds between these males are formed during adolescence, and they'll engage in courtship and sexual behaviours to cement their bond. And they become constant companions, and they watch out for their partner while they're resting, and they protect each other from predators. And so it's, it, yeah, it's, it's a really quite from a human looking perspective, very beautiful relationship they've got there. Absolutely, because the uh, uh, social life, uh, uh, socializing in, in dolphins is, is incredibly important, isn't it? And I know we're, you know, we're anthropomorphizing, but it's almost like they have BFFs. Yeah, or more. <laughs> and, but, and dolphin socialization is really complex as well because they're so intelligent and they live in these quite big groups. Um, and then those groups kind of collect into even larger groups. So their communication and social dynamics are really fascinating. So just a couple more questions to go. Uh, so our, our fourth question in this round, uh, we were asking you um, which of these aquatic birds has not been known to form long lasting same sex pairs in the wild? So we had geese, swans, ducks, and albatrosses so potentially a tricky question here there's there's a couple of things going on but let's see our answer it was ducks it's actually ducks now um ducks have obviously been known to engage in some same-sex behaviors but uh for most species of ducks they form pair bonds that only last uh, for uh, just a few months, four to eight months. Uh, so they'll often find uh, a new mate each year. So they sort of practice seasonal monogamy. But geese uh, and swans uh, and also albatrosses, they live for a long time and they've also been known to form long lasting pair bond, uh, bonds between uh, same sexes that last for many, many years. So ducks, not long term, but Geese, swans, and albatrosses, long lasting pair bonds in the wild. Ducks here for a good time, not a long time. <laughs> so, we just have one more question to get through. Um, hopefully, our, our viewers are doing very, very well so far. One final question. Um, and this one was, uh, this one was uh, about uh, non reproductive behaviors, wasn't it, Khalil? Yeah, so we were specifically looking at bonobos. Ch pygmy chimpanzees, who are some of our closest relatives in terms of evolutionary terms. And they're famous for being very kind of affectionate and, and caring and, and sharing and social with each other. And in bonobo society, sex is employed in a number of different ways, uh, as well as just for reproduction. And we asked you to name one other reason uh, that bonobos have been observed engaging in sexual behavior. And so we've got a, a list of possible answers here. Uh, one would be to facilitate sharing of food, to reconcile after disputes, to help integrate new arrivals to the group, to help form coalitions or in exchange for food. Um, and we'll also accept because it's fun. <laughs> those all seem like pretty legit reasons. Um, I'm pretty sure. I've, yeah. Yeah. Those seem like legit reasons. Absolutely. And, and yeah, as we mentioned earlier, they have this reputation for the you know that they're constantly they're constantly at it but that's not actually true uh, they they do um have have sex for, for reasons other than reproduction but it, it tends to be in specific situations um so yeah in situations of uncertainty in situations of conflict in in social situ situations um that's when when it happens it's there. i mean we've all been there right 
absolutely <laughs> <laughs> and of course yeah we will accept uh for fun because i mean <laughs> surely <laughs> they're definitely smart enough <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> So we have come to the end of our quiz. But how did you do out there, our viewers? Tot up your scores. Now, by my calculation, there were a possible uh, there were a possible 14 points that you could have won uh, during our quiz. So tot up your answers. Uh, pop your uh, your uh, your answers your uh, your your um, scores in our um in in the comments window we'll, we'll see don't forget your team names as well yeah team name and scores in the comments we'll, we'll see how you guys did khalil how, how would you have done in that quiz do you reckon i would not have done well at all but personally <laughs> no i'm not to, meant to play favorites with the viewers but i'm rooting for gonad or go home just because it's <laughs> name um, actually we've had a report gonad or go home seven points seven Suffer. points has anyone got higher than seven or is gonad or go home the champions <laughs> Seven is pretty impressive. That was that was a tough quiz, I think. That's an almost worrying amount of knowledge about animal sex. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we've got uh, we've got lots of people uh, loving uh, loving the, the the quiz, which is great. Um, I hope I hope that you you guys all enjoyed it. I hope that you found it interesting um, and accessible. I hope you learned. Uh, something new about mates and mating. I certainly learned an awful lot tonight. Uh, things I, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> some things I wish I didn't know. <laughs> but I guess, you know, the, the more we learn over time, the more we discover about the natural world, the, the more we realise that actually it's, it's a lot more complicated than a lot of the simple ways that we might traditionally have broken it down in the past. Um, you know, we heard about intersex frogs, and things like that. And so a lot of the, you know, maybe quite rigid thing, ways that we've compartmentalized mating and sex and stuff like that, we might need to reassess going forwards, whether that's, you know, with animals or with humans or, you know, we are just animals anyway. Absolutely. There is, there is there's that incredible diversity that extends through all areas of life, including um, sex and mating. Um, so we shouldn't be surprised that 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 we see this this incredible broad spectrum out there. It's it's I think it's fantastic. We've got a few more scores. Team Edgar and friends got uh, they scored eight. So oh, oh they, no, Gonads have been knocked off the top spot. They, they beat Tom. <laughs> <laughs> only just though, only just. <laughs> oh, and Ooh. Mike. It's getting otter in here. Otter in here. <laughs> Another amazing name. Eight, Eight points. points. Okay, so we've got two teams in the joint first. Absolutely. I'm so proud of all of you. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Massive congratulations to you all. Thank you so much for taking part in our quiz tonight. For, you, for sticking with us as well on one of the hottest days of the year. <laughs> we've sticking being the word. Sticking definitely being the word. We hope that you guys enjoyed our evening event as much as we did. We will be um, back again next month with another online late. We also have our online nature lives every week as well. If you haven't tuned into one of those, I would highly recommend. Uh, we have chats with our scientists every Tuesday at 12 and every Friday at 10.30 a.m. on all kinds of topics. Uh, another great way to hear from our scientists to see uh, more of our collections and to find out some really, really fascinating uh, stuff as well so do join us again soon but for now we'll wish you goodbye we'll hope you all have a fantastic weekend hope to see you all again soon bye for now